Hey there, it is time for another in real life video. Uh, this time we are doing a little bit of a, a let's watch, right? I figured that's what we can call these. Uh, we can do this for other sort of video game to television or film adaptations in the future if we want. We'll call them Let's Watch. But yeah, a lot of folks uh, replied to the last in real life video we did saying that they would probably prefer if I did a sort of recap, brief analysis or whatever after every two episodes of the show. So, hey, here we are. Uh, anyway, before we get started with all of that, I've taken some notes here. So if you see me glance down, that's me looking at my notebook. Uh, hopefully I've, I've noted things down well enough. Sorry if I forget anything. Uh, as well, because it's pretty late. I just got done watching uh, the first two episodes. I'm pretty tired, but wow, it was definitely worth it. And we'll we'll keep on uh, we'll keep on going with this. I'm I'm super. Uh, uh, all right, I, I guess we'll just talk about the show in general. Uh, if you haven't seen yet, reviews landed uh, hours ago now at this point, as of when this published or this video got published. And uh, reviews are really good, right? People people love this thing. It's uh, I think it opened to a 95 on Rotten Tomatoes and is now sitting at like a 93. And based on the first two episodes, without going into spoiler territory just yet, I absolutely love it so far. It is shockingly good. Um, just speaking generally, uh. I've seen a lot of people say that it absolutely nails the tone of the games, and I completely agree. It is surprising, actually, how well it nails the tone. It is like... It's like one-third... Like a dark drama, melodrama, maybe even, right? Wherein there's, there's more serious matters afoot. Um... Maybe one third. I'm, I'm not even sure of one third. That might be pushing it. But there is definitely it keeps this the same kind of tongue in cheek, goofy comedy uh, that folks have come to know from the games with no shortage of like references to the games as well. There's there's posters, sound effects everywhere from the games. Um, all, all like if, if you've seen a poster in the video game or an ad in the video game or something in one of the video games, there's a good chance you will see it, right? Uh, the set design, as we have been seeing for ages now of the leaked sets, it looks incredible. It, it is the attention to detail is absurd. Uh, the interior of the vaults of, um, well, the vault that we have seen so far is it's ridiculous. It's it's so incredibly thorough. Everything uh, they've they've got the little working panels and stuff for the vault doors, the like doors between each room, as as we had seen them in Fallout Three and Seventy Six. It it is so incredibly well done. Uh, when you see vault like the main vault doors open and stuff, all of that. It's just like the games. It's it's absurd. It it almost fills you with like, I don't know, a sense of weird pride and belonging if you're familiar with them. And like I said, they, they play sound effects from the games all the time uh, whenever it's appropriate, not just like Pip-Boy sound effects, but all over. Like um, sometimes you'll hear like the sound of bottle cap lids. Sometimes you'll hear the sounds of stim packs being injected, right? It's the same exact uh, like Foley work or sound effects as was used in the games. It's, it's incredibly surreal, just like the attention to detail as well. Um, I would be completely remiss not to mention the original soundtrack. Of course they use plenty of music from the games and also of the era. Um, it seems like every episode is going to at minimum open and close with a known song that was used in the games but um just the the original soundtrack that plays during like you know scenes of exploration people going around people fighting shootouts and stuff like that it sounds so much like what you get in the games um not just the contemporary stuff but as well it sounds like like it could totally fit in 
like classic fallout it it is ridiculous how how much it it just sounds like it fits it's it's incredible um it definitely seems like they 100% like studied the hell out of the games and just as well um i remember seeing this way early on i i think jonathan nolan the sort of lead creative the lead director for all of this and certainly for the first two episodes um it it is very obvious the guy has claimed that he's a big fan of of all of it of all of fallout and i think it 100 percent you can see all the way through that this is absolutely the case um it is it is incredible it like as an adaptation it is it is so wild and and even calling it an adaptation is a bit wild in and of itself because you know unlike other unlike uh like for instance the last of us which i did also enjoy um that had a lot of sort of one-to-one recreations of different scenes but of course this is its own original story set in the same world set within canon and the show is actual canon right um but they still accomplish this like absurd level of reverence for the games it is it is incredible uh honestly how how much they have going for it in that regard right and it's not just limited to like i said you see oh power armor or oh there's a a bobblehead it's it's like there's stuff everywhere it feels truly like like you're seeing the game come to life it's it's I don't know. It's incredible. It's incredible how they've done it. Um, now I want to get into our little spoiler talk where we sort of recap and do a little brief analysis of the first two episodes of the show. Um, so we'll try to be brief here, right? Like I said, I'm tired. I think this works better if it's brief as well. Uh, we'll do a longer sort of recap of all this at the end if folks didn't want to watch the Let's Watch specifically. Uh, but it opens, of course, as we sort of predicted in the prediction video. And I feel like, you know, this this is it makes sense. It opens with uh, Walton Goggins' character, who I don't think we know the name of. No, I think we did. I think we heard the name of of this character. They're, they're like pre-war original name but i cannot remember it and he is at like a birthday party of some sort of um super wealthy family and stuff for a kid's birthday party he is there as like a character as um like this rootin' tootin' shootin' cowboy character that he uh, has played on like television right and of course they turn on the television the kids they, they go to look at cartoons and of course you know there's like there's Grognak, right? It's incredible. Um, but there as well is his daughter, and apparently he's gone through like um, a divorce recently, and he's still trying to like handle that. And uh, these super rich a holes are sort of laughing about him being kind of this washed up actor type who is a bit in a bit of a like desperate situation, and they're trying to get him to do. You know, the, the old sort of like dance monkey dance situation where, you know, he's known for this kind of schlocky role and they want him to sort of lean into it for the kid's birthday party. You know, that that old chestnut, that old trope. But um, sort of in the middle of it, they don't hear anything on the news or the radio because they turn it to cartoons. And um, his daughter sees, holy cow, uh, the city of Los Angeles right in front of them as they're up in like the Beverly Hills area, I think. Um, it gets nuked. A gigantic atomic bomb goes off. Uh, buildings are shattering. It's horrifying. Uh, they reference the, I don't, I don't even know if it's real or not. Right. I always, whenever I heard it, the context I was always given is that it was, it was just a faked fan theory and wasn't actually true. But either way, they do make reference to, at the very least, the fan theory, whether or not it's true, I have no idea. Uh, where you put up your thumb over like a mushroom cloud to sort of judge the distance and that's why vault boy does it that's why vault boy is giving the thumbs up because of the like atomic uh, mushroom cloud explosion and all of that and his daughter does that they have a little conversation um he says 
that he learned it in the military is where he learned it. So we have reason for, as this guy shows up later, why he's uh, going to be somewhat skilled with using firearms, uh, which when he shows up again, he most certainly is. Um, very, very fun scene, right? Uh, notably, and like I said, no newscast for this to be the case, but there is absolutely zero narration from Ron Perlman. There is so far no Ron Perlman in this whatsoever, uh, which is kind of a shame, kind of ironic. I feel given that Ron Perlman is a known like physical body actor, right? I, I wonder what happened there. You would have to imagine that they asked. I don't I don't know. But, um, yeah, there is no narration from him. No little cameo appearance from Ron Perlman. Very surprising. Um, but also, ultimately, I, I don't think it's necessary. Right. I think it does just fine without it. Um, very much. You could have it set up to where Ron Perlman is just sort of the voice of uh, things going on in the games. Right. I, I don't know. There's not even, like, a Ron Perlman stand-in in in the event that, like, Ron Perlman didn't want to do it, right? So, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, But, either way, no Ron Perlman. Anyway, then we go to uh, the vault scenes with Lucy, and we sort of get some insight into, like, what was going on with the vaults. And once again, like I said, you get this sort of immaculate looking recreation of vaults as you see them depicted in uh four and 76 which i think is kind of what they're going with forward you know they'll just be like how they look which i really i do really enjoy the sort of visual aesthetic of the contemporary games right i do think there's something to be said for the more diesel punk nature of like um what came before four and 76 76 because they definitely lean into the retro futurism a lot more um whereas the older games crpgs included definitely lean into um a lot more diesel punk ironically even though you know everything is so much atomic focused but regardless it looks amazing um we learn about sort of this it's not even very directly said it's done quite well in which, you know, they, they don't sort of insult the, the viewer by just spelling it out for you just directly straight up to your face. Um, you, you are sort of clued in as to the way in the sort of like weird experiment seemingly of vault 33. And that is that it is directly linked to vault 32, which, um, This is, well, we don't fully know everything about this situation, Um, but Vault 32 and 33 are directly linked to one another. There is an inter-Vault link, and Vault 32 has seemingly undergone, like, hard times. They've been affected by something called the Blight, wherein their, like, um, their crops, their corn is not turning out very well at all. There's a scene where, like, uh, Lucy's brother, uh, who I'm not sure is, like, a younger or older brother, or if they were, like, you know, it's it's barely relevant because they're so closely born together. Um, but, yeah, uh, we, we see that he kind of sneaks up in there. Um, we see a little bit of that. We don't fully know exactly what's up with that because it turns out that um, for this wedding, this sort of arranged marriage between a Vault 33 Denizen, that being Lucy, and a uh, 32 denizen, uh, we learn that all of Vault 32 has either always been for a long time, which is still possible, but it seems more so it's implied that they've all been replaced by raiders, which is odd because it sounds like they have married before between these vaults. I'm not sure how much time has passed, right? There's still a lot of open room for interpretation as to exactly how this has gone down, I think. Either that, or I was just too tired and missed it, or I was just too much of an idiot and missed it. Either is possible. Combination of the two, really. Um, But, uh, yeah, the entirety of Vault 32 is seemingly all raiders in disguise. It's slowly, like, hinted at uh, in that they look very different 
from the more pristine Vault 33 denizens. Her father, Lucy's father, is the overseer and ultimately has to choose between sort of the um, the raiders have him make a choice whether uh, you choose between the lives of Lucy, his daughter, or uh, a group of vault dwellers. And ultimately, he chooses her, right? He, he very much loves her, which, you know, fair enough, understandable. This is your daughter, Um pretty pretty horrible to not to like it sucks to to kill off everyone but i don't know like you get where it's coming from it's it's not seen as like a terribly evil act more so like um understandable human humanity like a human weakness part um but they managed to escape and survive a like gigantic jury rigged explosive device going off uh which fair enough it is inside of a vault designed to withstand explosions but uh they run away from them they escape but hank is taken hostage by like seemingly the leader of this band of raiders moldova i think or moldover something like that um he's taken hostage by her they seemingly have some kind of history that we don't fully know everything about yet. We're left kind of in the dark. Probably a lot more to come up later as we sort of get into Raider territory um, with Lucy and co. Um, but, yep, uh, suffice it to say, she leaves the vault looking for her dad, right? We get that one. Uh, I think a lot of contemporary Fallout seems very in- like at least under Bethesda's stewardship seems interested in like a family aspect right and i feel like they're carrying that on but even so it's not terribly important in the grand scheme of things given the fact that we have three different protagonists uh right and we're about to hit over to another one the third one uh but before before we do that uh it's got to be said they really show off um sort of the size and scope of vault 33 of a vault that you kind of don't have access to fully in the games. It's meant to be implied in the games, even from the CRPGs, right? Uh, that the vaults are so much bigger than you can actually explore. Cause there's a point where they look down the elevator shaft that leads to the main entry exit point, the main blast door. And you can sort of see like loads of back areas and, different floors of the vault there's tons of it um it's it's incredibly expansive you you can't you can't see it and not help but be reminded of sort of playing portal and when you get into the back the back room areas of portal one and two but um regardless she steps out it she's got her own sort of uh vault dweller protagonist moment you know when you put your your hand up as the sun is glaring into your eye and you slowly phase or phase in the the environment around you and it's oh it's a horrible wasteland but there is in some weird way beauty to it um you get you get to see the santa monica pier there's some skeletons and stuff some corpses remains outside of the vault as you would expect uh, notably upon exiting the vault we only see the proper exit for vault 33 uh there is no proper exit that is marked vault 32 which is pretty fascinating i wonder if that exists somewhere else or what i have no idea um but true enough the vault gear door entrance or whatever is labeled 33 even though you know they're interlinked and there's seemingly no sign of 32 anywhere nearby uh but that is lucy's motivating uh drive is to go out and find her father and that leads us like i said to our third protagonist and we're doing sort of a like a lot of contemporary television does this wherein there are multiple protagonists so you can sort of break up pacing and you don't have to dwell on like lower action periods where it's like oh they're just traveling and we don't really have anything particularly interesting to show during this traveling. We don't have like a funny world building moment or anything clever like that. Um, you know, the, the stuff that you sort of really noticed with, I think, Game of Thrones, but tons of contemporary prestige television do it nowadays, wherein, you know, there's multiple leads. You swap between them as, as you see fit in order to try and keep the pacing going at 
at a good pace. Uh, but now we're at Maximus, who is kind of a fresh new member of the Brotherhood of Steel, isn't even officially a squire. Uh, we see a little bit of like his backstory of him seeing another, like a knight, I think. Um, and that's how he is recruited as like a kid. And I think it's in episode two that we see him come out of a fridge. So we get another fridge kid, a uh, little wink and nod, I think. Though maybe that was in episode one. I don't know. I've kind of blended them together a bit. But um, uh, here with the Brotherhood scenes, we get mentions actually of the Commonwealth in addition to getting to see, I believe, the Pridwin. We don't know for certain, but it really seems like it's the Pridwin. Um, as far as I know, there aren't any other operational like airships. So I would assume this is the Pridwin. Uh, but yeah, Commonwealth name dropped, um, as well as we get to see sort of this newer interpretation of the Brotherhood of Steel, which I wonder if a lot of folks will dislike, but I actually really, really enjoy it. Um, they seem in addition to like their fanatical militarism, they also have this sort of religious bent, which you would expect, wherein they follow their own sort of religious doctrine. And it's sort of alluded to by way of their like knightly order uh, references and all of that, right? With with all of the the brother, you know, like, oh, I'm a paladin or whatever, right? There's a lot of allusions to them having this religious bent in the games, but it is very rarely explored in such a way. You've got like, you know, a priestly, like, cleric type walking around with, like, a, a little ornamental smoke incense burner. Um, the squires get... This is so dope, I think. This definitely does not exist in the games as far as I know in any way. Um, maybe it was in, like, Fallout Brotherhood of Steel or Tactics, but in all of the games that I've played, uh, it does not exist, but is is rad as hell. And... I hope that they they take this from the show, honestly. I hope that they they take this. Wherein, for the knight, whenever a squire is assigned to a knight, which happens to Maximus, um, Maximus' Maximus's knight sort of superheats their power armor gauntlet or hand, right? And gets it so hot and just brands his back with like, I'm not even sure what it is. Some sort of like imprint from the the glove, from the gauntlet. It's not a glove. It's like you know the mechanical finger attachment or whatever, right? Uh, but dude is straight up branded in this way and is completely buck wild. I'm pretty sure one of the I don't think this guy is the elder, uh, but one of the scribes at the very least who is sort of talking to Maximus after um, this incident in which. Um, Maximus's friend was about to become a squire, but woke up to this horror of having like a enormous razor placed in their boot and their, their foot like shaved to the bone, uh, effectively in like the most horrifying manner. And thus they cannot be a squire. And a lot of people are like, Oh, who did this? Uh, Maximus's friend, of course, thinks, oh, Maximus wouldn't hurt a fly. And true enough, um, contrary to what I would have expected, uh, Maximus is a bit of a doofus, right? But perhaps there is like a darkness within him because uh, Maximus's friend is like, oh, Maximus wouldn't hurt a fly. And says like, oh, these other squires to be probably did this to me. But it is left open that Perhaps Maximus did do this. Perhaps there is something screwed up deep within Maximus, because we don't fully know everything about this dude's background. And I think it's entirely within the realm of possibility that, like, he is this kind of person, right? I don't know. Uh, but either way, it, it works great for a Brotherhood of Steel character to have that almost duality, I think. Um, but, yeah... Uh, one of the scribes there, I think, is, um, what's his name? One of the CEOs, one of the CEO characters from Mr. Robot. And he's doing pretty, pretty damn good there. Uh, let's see. What else did I write here? Oh, yes. We learned that we learn of this escaped scientist guy, right? 
We've seen him in the trailers, played by Michael Emerson. I don't even remember his name. Dr. Science is what I'm going to be calling him. Uh, but he has sort of escaped from there, and he is confirmed, my God, am I the smartest man alive or what? But this guy is Enclave. They explicitly refer to him as Enclave. Um, and they say as well, he has escaped from the Enclave. Right. So I'm not sure what the hell exactly is going on. What sort of like does the Brotherhood here on the West Coast have like a zone of control over the remnants of the Enclave, which they do also refer to them as remnants, I believe. Um, but we see that he escapes with um, dog meat, we presume, and has like a little blue something or other injected into him that he had been experimenting on though that maybe we see that in episode two uh but yeah we sort of see this the nature of the brotherhood of steel and they're definitely seen to be as like they're they're just straight up seen as being like a-holes right they're just seen immediately as being not great folks um there is very little beating around the bush with regards to their sort of morality um, more so like the most you see of it is sort of Maximus's naivete toward the situation and hopefulness that they could change the world for good. But all that we see as the audience watching the show is like, yeah, these guys are fucking assholes, right? <laughs> that's, that's the, the throughput of what we see about them, which fair enough. If, if you are familiar with the games, that's, um, I don't know. That's generally the main takeaway at this point as to the current standing brotherhood of steel but yeah you kind of have that going on and then toward the end of the episode uh the ghoul finally returns and is dug up seemingly i think i would guess um these three i don't know these three bounty hunters i guess are searching for none other than our scientist Right, They have accepted a bounty and is one that is paying really huge. I don't think we yet know until episode two who it is they're looking for, but it is uh, Dr. Science that they're looking for. Um, we don't know for who, though. We don't know exactly who put out the bounty. Uh, we could presume the Brotherhood, but we don't know for... In fact, it's probably not the Brotherhood who put out the bounty. Yeah, it may be the Raiders. I'm not sure. Yeah we, yeah, we actually don't know, do we? Yeah, we don't actually know who put out the bounty, because if it were the Brotherhood, I believe we would have known, right? Maybe not. Maybe it's just a big mix-up, right? That's possible as well. Um, but um, we know that Don Pedro posted a bounty, and I don't think it's for Don Pedro himself. Uh, but given the mention of Don Pedro and that the fact that this seems a little bit further out, I can I could not help but wonder... If this part of the show where they were digging up the ghoul who was sort of like kept barely alive on like an IV drip underground in a literal like coffin, um, I could not help but wonder, is this in like the new Reno cemetery, right? From Fallout 2. I could not help but wonder that, especially with the mention of a Don Pedro that that very much reeks of Fallout 2 to me. Uh, but like I said, I don't think we know for certain one way or the other. Uh, there's, of course, like a a crucified skeleton on sort of like an electrical or telephone pole or whatever. Uh, but I don't think there's... I think we see that in other games as well. That's not just specific to like New Vegas or whatever, right? I don't think we can really draw anything from that. But it definitely feels like a nod. Uh, anyway... Then we have episode two where they just straight up open with Dr. Science incinerating puppies, which, you know, is always sort of a, a great way to, um, you know, let the audience know, oh, is this is this character a bit more villainous or a bit more friendly? Well, just have them, you know, screw over a dog. But then, of course, now then we come to wonder, oh, actually, does Dr. Science like the dogs? Does Dr. Science like dogs? Because he hides this dog kind of... Um, dog meat right uh behind a broken up wall as they're doing tests and in some way dog meat is important right oh my gosh like i said am i not the smartest man alive or what but dog meat is in some way a scientific macguffin just as much as 
uh, Dr. Science, since he has this like weird injection, we don't really know what it is. Um, we could presume that maybe this is some form of FEV like done up differently in the future. Granted, FEV is typically shown as like greenish yellow, and this was definitely blue. So I don't know. But um, uh, we get to see as well, Dr. Science has a Pip-Boy, which I wonder if we're meant to read into that in any way, or if it's just, oh, they're under control by the Brotherhood, therefore Brotherhood has collected Pip-Boys by now and have them using them because, you know, Pip-Boys are incredibly useful. Uh, but just an odd, peculiar detail may come into play later. Don't know. Uh, anyway, we cut, we go over to Lucy again, who's wandering through the waste, sort of getting her experiences with the wasteland. She encounters this diaper guy, um, which, uh, like I said, the show, a lot of the comedy, at least for me, really lands. There was really only one bit that did not land for me and felt a little campy, which we'll get to a bit later. Um, but the diaper guy turns out to be kind of kind um, in a weird and endearing way. And their whole interaction is pretty good, I think. Um, like I said, we see the cyanomonic appear. Uh, then we go back to, after the diaper guy scene, we go to Maximus, who, this is how Maximus gets power armor. Uh, the knight that he's with turns out to be, like, a massive, massive a-hole and gets completely screwed up as they're going around looking for Dr. Science, who has escaped. They're looking for him on the ground. We get this cool shot of the interior of the vertebrate. They're going over, like, Desert flats, I think. I think. It may be snow, but I think it's like desert flats, like sand flats. Uh, but they're flying over that. Then they get to a woodland area, kind of where Lucy is, is heading, um, where the diaper guy pointed her toward, where there's like this certain lushness as well, a, a vibrant lush area, uh, kind of surrounded by desert, by wasteland. Uh, but Maximus and... His knight Titus, I think, are there, and they encounter Yao Guai, the one that we see in the trailer. Um, his knight is a bit of a, a like, freak. I don't know. Like, he's he's a super he's super cowardly. He's like way more uh, bark than bite. He's he talks a big game, but when push comes to shove, he is like such a pissant and gets completely screwed over by the Yao Guai. His, like, Fallout 4 look in the assault rifle gets screwed up. His power armor gets a little screwed up, but not terribly so, right? The power armor's still very much intact. More so the Yao Guai is smart enough to, like, um, pull off parts of it to access the fleshy inside. Um, and thus, power armor guy, the knight, relies on Maximus to shoot with his pistol, the Yao Guai and dude straight up must be like on easy mode or something because Maximus one shots the Yao Guai with a single bullet to the head. Uh, pretty damn wild. Uh, they're using, of course, ballistic weapons. We haven't yet seen any laser weapons or plasma weapons or anything like that. Uh, the most sci fi thing we have seen so far is Lucy's like syringer, uh, as far as weapons are concerned. I think, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but. This is ultimately how Maximus gets power armor. He's he's doned it. He's fairly inexperienced with it. He's enjoying it and stuff. He's uh, he's there's some comedic slapstick moments where he like knocks over a building accidentally because um, this is like a great scene for people to people unfamiliar with Fallout to be introduced to the concept of like okay what's kind of the power level of someone in power armor? How strong is this? And it's like, yeah, this bear can barely get inside of it. It's very difficult. The only reason I was able to is because the guy piloting it was a complete dickhead, idiot, coward. And, um, it's massively amplifies your strength, uh, completely re deflects most bullets, right? Small arms fire is like nothing against it. feels very much in line with how you feel, controlling power armor in fallout 4 and 76 right probably one of the best parts and coolest parts of that game i would say on a mechanical level on a systems level at least um they do make reference to like oh to having tempered lining on the power armor which i thought was very fun uh, of course you see every so often like improvised weapons i think uh in episode one in the vault with the raiders 
you can very clearly see a like modified monkey wrench with like the big gear on it that I think adds like a bleed damage to it. But you totally see that. Um, but yeah, back with Maximus, he arrives uh, along with Lucy in Philly, which is not like Philadelphia at all. I have no idea why it is called Philly. Maybe I missed it. But uh, Lucy is there to sort of uh, track down information about her father. And she runs into Ma June, who actually turns out to be incredibly funny, I thought. I thought the scenes with Ma June were really good. I thought her delivery was, like, excellent. Um, but Lucy is there trying to track down um, her father. She runs into Dr. Science again, because she had met him before on the road. Sort of the nighttime rad roach scene that was in one of the trailers. Um, she sees him there. They sort of get along decently enough. But turns out a bounty hunter is there and it is the ghoul and he's there to claim the bounty on Dr. Science. And the this is where, in addition to the ending of the first episode, wherein uh, the ghoul totally like annihilates uh, the three bounty hunters who came to get him out of the grave. Right. Which true enough, they seem also in part responsible or at least on the side of Don Pedro and they seemed somewhat responsible for him being under the ground. But um, uh, he is back. He is ready to shoot up the entirety of Philly just to get Dr. Science, just to make a uh, major bank on collecting this bounty. Uh, but Lucy is there. And uh, like I said, honestly, Maximus seems like the bigger fish out of water than Lucy. Um, I was expecting it to be Lucy, but she seems far more like she is a fish out of water, but she seems so much more sure of herself uh, by way of just like unearned confidence and naivete, just unchecked naivete about the situation. And it works incredibly well, I think, for her. Um, it's incredibly charming just as well. Uh, Walton Goggins, as everyone predicted, myself included, dude is absolutely chewing the scenery up every time he's on screen. He is nailing it. Um, he gets into a fight with Maximus who shows up and tries to help Lucy because Maximus is on like a streak of trying to do good, but, um, isn't terribly good at being good and is using the power armor. And I guess, I don't know if, if the ghoul necessarily knows how to take down power armor because, uh, there is a point where the back, the fusion core in the back is 100% exposed to the ghoul and dude could totally take a gazillion easy shots at that fusion core and just pop that thing right out. Uh, but he does not. Right. So I'm guessing he doesn't know or something. I, I have no idea. Maybe there's uh, new countermeasures in place, or maybe that's strictly just a game mechanic, but I don't know. Cause they make a lot of other game mechanics fairly canon in this, like how stim packs can heal you up from grievous wounds, stuff like that. Uh, you know, the existence of jet people just popping drugs left and right. Uh, but we have this big fight, uh, between the three of them, Lucy and the ghoul fight. Um, he blows off the leg of Dr. Science who ends up getting a new leg sort of grotesquely attached by like this nightmare fucking blender at, by Ma June. And it is, it is so horrifying. The, the, the show has no qualms with being like intensely gory <laughs> at times, uh, which true enough, uh, that's how it was in the games. You know, everybody's fucking running the bloody mess perk here. Uh, but, um, Maximus and the ghoul sort of have a big fight, but of course, Maximus has no idea how to fucking use the power armor appropriately. And we end sort of that fight with like, um, but in like a true enough, when the ghoul is having a shootout, in the town. Absolutely incredible, right? Just a really dope action scene. Um, you get to sort of see like, oh damn, this dude is rolling up with the like new Vegas character loadout. He's got like some sort of revolver packed with explosive ammo. We've got a lever action uh, slung across his back. And of course he's got all of his like cowboy garb. He's fully sort of embraced the character that he pretended to be as a human, you know, we can sort of divine that just from the visual appearance uh, of the character and the costuming. It's done very well. 
Uh, but like I said, pretty much the the only bad part, the the only bit of comedy that didn't really land for me was uh, Maximus screwing up the jetpack on the power armor and then the ghoul sort of exploiting that with a bit of a lasso slash like chain hook situation, like sending him off kilter. And he does sort of like a, a very campy oh, team rock is blasting off again situation. He doesn't actually say that, but he's like, Oh, flying through the air. And uh, I don't know. That wasn't that great. I thought that was probably the weakest joke in, in the entire thing. And like I would say, pro- probably the only one that didn't land for me. Uh, but otherwise, uh, also during the fight, um, the ghoul, also, is this guy a dog meat lover or a dog meat hater? Who can say for sure? Um, maybe that's the main thesis of the show is, do these people hate dogs or do they love them? Because uh, dog meat charges after uh, Dr. Science gets his leg blown off, charges at the ghoul, tries to fuck him up, but uh, gets like stabbed or something off camera, still alive and whimpering. And after everything settles down, the ghoul feels bad about it, I guess, right? Uh, you know, to kind of go and show like, oh, this person has a monstrous appearance, but maybe there's still good inside of them, right? They can still find redemption or whatever. Um, but uh, pulls out a stim pack from the shop after everyone's cleared out and or dead um, from Ma June's shop. It's a stim pack, pops it into dog meat and dog meat don't care. Dog meat seems perfectly happy with that and perfectly happy to travel with the ghoul. And the ghoul seems happy to have dog meat along as well. And so they, they take off going looking for Dr. Science and Lucy. Uh, meanwhile, Maximus is like screwed off who knows where, crash landed in some peeing guy's backyard or whatever. <laughs> um, final interesting part of note is uh, Lucy has to, at the end of this episode, behead Dr. Science with a ripper. And because he had this injection or whatever, which I guess implies that it's not a chemical, it's some sort of device. I don't know, but it hasn't spread enough or at the very least it's good. His head is worthwhile to keep. Um, I have no idea what's going on there except for uh, we know what you can do with a human being's head in Fallout and you can totally use the brain for other stuff, right? whether that be for like a cyber dog or what I think is more likely in this case, um, a robo brain, right? I think Dr. Science will 100% come back as a sort of robo brain. I think that is definitely going to happen. But yeah, at the end we, we fade to black as you hear Lucy like rip sawing, rippering his head clean off. Well, probably not clean, but off of his body. And she goes to take it to, uh, Moldova or Moldova, the the same raider leader that attacked Vault 33 and has her dad and Ma June and well, not Ma June sort of gave her information on that. But Dr. Science is the one who clues her in like, oh, if she has your father, this is a great bargaining chip. Right. And I do wonder what the interest is in her father. We don't fully know. Uh, it seems like they have some kind of history. Like I said, it's a little bit um, cloaked in mystery as to the relationship between these raiders. Like, how often have they been there? This definitely doesn't seem like the first time they've at least been at Vault 32. Maybe the first time they've broken into 33 through the inter- interlinked doors or whatever. I'm not sure. Either way... Uh, That concludes our first two sort of episode recap and brief analysis or whatever. Uh, Hopefully the next two, the next ones will be a bit shorter because good Lord, look at the runtime already. We're going pretty long. Uh, I'll try to get this video out ASAP. Um, We'll do one every two, I think, when I have time. I'm very much enjoying the show, like I said. Uh, Absolutely recommend checking it out. Holy cow, it's, it's fantastic so far. Uh, everybody's saying it's fantastic going forward. I can't wait. Uh, I'm super tired. Otherwise, I would go watch another one, right? Uh, anyway, uh, until next time, please take care of each other.